Well, now it's interesting the dating of this. Homo sapiens is said to go back 30,000 years. Neanderthal, 40 to 150,000. Swanscombe, 200,000. Erectus, that's China and Java man, 300,000. Australian man, 500,000. And now African man, 2.5 million, 3 million, 4 million. What do we say about all this? Well, the first thing we need to say very strongly is that nothing has yet been found that is half ape and half man. There are prehistoric human remains, but there's nothing half in half as yet. Second thing I want to say is that not all these groups are our ancestors, and that too is now acknowledged, so that anthropology is now in a state of flux, and these are not ours. Third thing, they don't follow a progressive order. Have you seen these pictures of a sort of ape gradually straightening up and getting a bigger head? I mean, I could do the same thing with aeroplanes. This is a picture of the evolution of supersonic aircraft. And it all looks so neat. But that didn't develop into that by itself. And just making a picture of the development doesn't prove a thing. In fact, it does prove that there was an intelligence making those things. But um, we've seen all this. It doesn't follow. Some of the earliest human remains had larger brains than today and walked more upright. And in fact, the consensus of opinion now is that none of these groups are ours. Most assume that evolution is Charles Darwin's theory. It isn't actually. It was Aristotle's. And in modern days, it was Erasmus Darwin who propounded it. That was Charles's granddad. But Charles picked it up from his atheist grandfather and he made it popular. Now, there are certain terms we need to know. The first is variation, which is the belief that there have been small gradual changes in form which are passed on to each generation. So each generation changes slightly and passes on the change. The second is that from those variations there has been a natural selection which means the survival of those most suited to their environment. In other words, against the coal pit heaps in northeast England, the black moth was more suited to camouflage than the white, so the white moth died out and the black moth survived. Now that the coal slag heaps have gone, in my part of the country, the northeast, the white moths are coming back again and the black moths are disappearing which is more suitable to its environment. There's a natural selection going on so that those that are more adapted to their environment survive. This selection is natural. It happens automatically within nature with no help from outside nature. Nature herself selects those species more suitable. But that slow gradual process has now changed. A Frenchman called Lamarck said that instead of slow gradual changes, there were sudden huge changes, mutations he called them. It was more like a staircase than an escalator. And there's been debate between these two things to try and account. Two more terms, then we can look at it. The first term, microevolution, believes that there has been limited change within certain animal groups, within the horse group or the dog group. And I believe that science has certainly proved microevolution. But the macroevolution is the belief that all animals came from the same origin and that all are related and all go back to the same simple form of life that developed into a more and more complex being. One other word that I want to introduce you to, which to me is crucial, it's the word struggle. Believing this, the word struggle means the survival of the fittest. And that is a concept that has caused more suffering in the 20th century, more human suffering than almost any other idea. I want to show you how in a moment. I'm not going to argue the case for or against evolution except to point out that evolution is still a theory. It has not been proven. And in fact, the more evidence we get from fossil life, the less it looks 
like being an adequate theory of how the different forms of life arose. For example, in the fossil evidence, most different groups appear simultaneously quite quickly in the Cambrian period. They don't gradually appear over ages. They appear almost together. Secondly, the complex forms of life and the simple forms of life appear together. There isn't a train from the simple to the complex. Thirdly, there are very, very few bridge fossils that are halfway between one species and another. Next, all life, right from the beginning, is very complicated. It always had DNA in it. Next, mutations, sudden changes, usually deform and cause creatures to die out. Next, interbreeding usually leads to st sterility. And so I could go on. Above all, the statistics do not allow for this to have happened. There isn't enough time. That's why a new theory is that life started on another planet and floated through space and landed here. There really isn't enough time here, statistically, for all these varieties to have developed. I want to go on to something quite different. The effect of this theory on human beings. Not only has it fed our pride in thinking we have come so far that we are going to go on, up and up and up and on and on and on, as an English Prime Minister put it, which is rather better than back to basics. <laughs> but uh, I want to show you now what has happened with this word struggle. You find it in fascism. Adolf Hitler's book was called My Struggle. And he believed in the survival of the fittest, the fittest being the German Aryan race, and certainly not the Jewish people. You find it in communism. Karl Marx wrote about the struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, which must issue in revolution. You find it this word struggle in the early days of colonialism, when people were simply wiped out in the name of progress. And I am bold enough to say that this idea, the survival of the fittest, when applied to human beings, has caused more suffering than any other idea. But it has also faced us with two huge choices. And I'm going to take a few extra minutes in this talk just to give you these choices. What are we really saying when we look at the issue of creation and evolution? It faces us with a mental choice. If you believe in creation, you believe in a father God. If you believe in evolution, you tend to go for mother nature, a lady who doesn't exist. If you believe in creation, you believe that this universe was the result of a personal choice or an impersonal chance. That there was a designed purpose under creation, but under evolution, only a random pattern. With creation, the universe is a supernatural production. In evolution, it's a natural process. Under creation, the whole universe is an open situation, open to personal intervention, both by God and man. Here, we have nature as a closed system that operates itself. There, we have the concept of providence, that God cares for his creation and provides for it and looks after it. Here, we have simply coincidence. When anything good happens, it's merely a coincidence. On that side, we have a faith based on fact. On this side, a faith based on fancy, for it's simply a theory. On that side, God is free to make something and to make man in his own image. On this side, man is free to make God in whatever image he chooses in his imagination. That's the kind of mental difference of thinking of creation and evolution. But when we look beyond that, we see that behind it there is a moral choice. See, the question we're trying to answer now is, why is it that people seize on the theory of evolution, hold it almost fanatically, 
The answer is deep down. It's the only alternative if you want to believe there is no God over us. Under creation, God is Lord. Under evolution, man is Lord. Creation, we are under divine authority, but here we are autonomous as humans and can decide things for ourselves. Here there are absolute standards of right or wrong. Here there are only relative situations. Here we talk of duty and responsibility, but here we talk of demand and rights. There we have an infant dependence. We become as little children and speak of a heavenly father. But here man is proud of adult independence. Man come of age, no longer needing God. There man is a fallen creature. Here he is rising. There salvation of the weak. Here survival of the strong. Nietzsche, the philosopher behind Hitler, said he hated Christianity because it kept weak people going. It looked after sick people and dying people. But his philosophy was survival of the strong. There, right is might, sorry, right is might, that when you do what is right, you are powerful. Here, might is right. When you are powerful, whatever you do is right. That leads to a situation of peace, this to war, always has done. That emphasizes obedience. This says, indulge yourself. That says, faith, hope, and love are the three main virtues in life. This says, fatalism, helplessness, and luck are where we are. That leads to heaven. This leads to hell. I have drawn this out so that you can see where the theory begins to lead when you think of man as simply a developed animal. I am not surprised when children have been told for 10 years in school, you came from the animals, if when they leave school they behave like that.